All right. Do you like to time travel? Well, not really time travel. I mean, go back in time and study history. Well, come with us as we go back into the Hebrew revelation that John wrote. We're going to go back to some first century sources and see what it says, compare it to the Greek and English in this walkthrough study of the Cochin Hebrew revelation. Let us begin. I am Brian Scott Williams, and this is Project Truth Ministries, and I have with us the Hebrew grammarian, Janice Baca. Say hello, Janice Baca, and give us a little introduction about this chapter. Absolutely, Brian. It is so exciting to be with you guys today. Um, we are looking at something pretty exciting in Revelation chapter 6. We have the seals that Yeshua is breaking. And of course, we began with the four horsemen. And you would think that it would look something like you've seen before in the Greek. But guess what? It's a little bit different. And I think it's going to be an eye opener for you because this is going to be something you've not seen before. So pretty exciting stuff. I'm thrilled to be with you to present this today. And I hope that uh, you will continue to watch and learn with us and that we will grow together. That's right. And in this study, we are hoping to empower you and give you the tools and the uh, study information so that you can learn text criticism on your own and you can then apply it to other parts of the Bible. And it's really exciting. So now... In this particular chapter, there are a lot of minute little details that we're going to point out, and it's going to be really amazing. So I can't wait to share that with you. Now let's go ahead and start with reading of chapter six. And now chapter six. And I saw the lamb open one of the seals, and I heard the four living creatures say as one voice, come and see. Then I saw a white horse, and he who sat upon him had a bow in his hand and a crown given to him, and he proceeded to prevail and be victorious. And when the second seal was opened, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Then another went out, a red horse sitting upon it was authorized to take peace from the earth and he was given a great sword. Then, when the third seal was opened, the third living creature said, Come and see! And I saw a black horse, and one sitting upon it was with a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A measure of wheat were two faces, three measures of barley or two faces, but the oil and the wine do not injure. And when the fourth seal opened, I heard the fourth living creature say, Come and see. Then I saw a strong muddled horse, and the one who sat upon him was named the messenger of death, and Gehenna went after him. He was given authority to cause death to a fourth upon the earth with sword, hunger, and death by the living creatures of the earth. And when he opened the fifth, I saw beneath the holy place the souls that were killed for the holy name and for the sake of their testimony. Then they shouted with a great voice, saying, The Lord is holy and faithful. Until when will you judge and avenge our blood from those dwelling upon the earth? And every one of them was given white garments, and it was said to them, Relax still a little while. Then I saw that he opened the sixth. Then there were tremblings of the earth, and the sun became dark and the moon was red as blood. All their armies dropped as a withering leaf from the vine, so like a withering fig tree. Then all the mountains and hills he moved to and fro, and they were shaken from their places. And the kings of the earth, the rulers, the wealthy, 
the officers, the servants, and the freemen hid themselves in rocks, in caves, and in the burrows of the earth, saying to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from before the sight of him who sits upon the throne, who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath of anger has come, and who will be able to stand before him? All right, and so this is chapter 6, verse 1, and it states, And I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard the four living creatures say as one voice, Come and see. So this is, it, it, it's getting more intense at this point. And you're going to see in the grammar a few things going on. There's going to be this, the grammar of uh, intensification, so to speak, the grammar of there's uh, something growing and something escalating. And in the Hebrew, it looks much more powerful. Now, from this point forward, the grammar gets extremely mixed up to a degree. I say mixed up. It's more of the, the author, John, of course, is having a, he still continues to have some trouble with his grammar. Now, is this something of a tradition for that region, for, for the area where he comes from or is it according to like we so like what we see in acts 4 13 where peter and john are ignorant men and i and i lean towards that because we know that john and peter were ignorant men that is clearly in scripture and uh, i believe that's what we're looking at is the confusion of that and he's simply trying to tell the story but this is where it is going to be very exciting at this point forward. I say this point, we've already seen some really exciting stuff so far, but now it is going to be amazing things that we're about to see in the grammar. Yep, absolutely. And you, I could also point out to the Greek and Aramaic, you see it gets a little clunky too in how they are putting these sentences together. So that could be a score point for this Hebrew uh, origin source that maybe that's why the Greek is all clunky and weird looking is that it's just coming from John and he's just not, not as well educated as uh, the other disciples. One of the things that is interesting to me is we have the lamb and it's also the lamb in this one. When you look at the scriptures and the Aramaic and even the King James, we have the lamb for this verse, but keep your eye on that in the english they stop using the word the lamb and they go to he also in this uh first verse we have and you compare it to the king james and even in this the scriptures in the aramaic you see the sound of thunder referring to these four living creatures speaking and one of them is speaking whereas ours say in one voice now, Janice, could this be a translation that maybe all four are speaking at one time, or is it from the four, one of them is speaking in a loud voice? What are your thoughts? Uh, is, it, is it possible through this grammar here? So through the grammar, um, keep in mind that voice, coal, can be voice or it can be sound. Now, I don't see anything because if when you look at the scriptures or rather from the Greek and the Aramaic, it clearly says a sound or a voice of thunder. And there is nothing in the Hebrew that basically says it's going to be a sound or a voice of thunder. Thunder is going to be something that was later added. So as far as who is speaking or if they're speaking all at once, it says, you know, basically that I saw the lamb opening one of the seals, a seal, and I heard that the four living creatures saying. Now, that word omrim is basically, it is plural, and it's all of them speaking at once. 
And so when you look at that, they are speaking all at once, but it is not specifying that it's a voice as a thunder. It's not even part of this Cochin revelation. That's an interesting difference. And and really, the focus is what they're saying for this sentence structure. Come and see. Well, come and see what's happening. The seal is being taken off. And it's, it's certainly more powerful to have all of the living creatures saying this one thing all together as opposed to just one of them if you just ask me verse two then i saw a white horse and he who sat upon him had a bow in his hand and a crown given to him and he proceeded to prevail and be victorious so i just want to talk about horses uh, real quick if uh, i may so horses, biblically speaking, and even in ancient times, they are symbols of war. Kings who would visit other cities would either come riding on a horse, which meant they were going to come to make war or conquer them, or they would come sitting on a donkey. A donkey meant peace. And as you remember, Yeshua came riding into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. So he came in peace. And even in the Arabic world, in the Muslim world today, you have kings or leaders of nations in the Middle East. They all have stables of white horses. And that's because it's kind of mixed into their end times prophecy that the Mahdi, the, the Messiah for their end times, will come riding in on a white horse. And so perhaps it could be them. And so they all keep white horses around, you know, because it's it's warfare and possibly be them. Maybe they could get all the power. But I know a lot of people will point to this verse and try to make it fit with Yeshua being the one who's riding on the horse. And it doesn't make sense textually because Yeshua is the one opening the seals. He is the lamb who's, who's crushing and breaking these seals so that these white horses this white horse could go out and the person who's sitting upon it is holding a bow and a crown. So when I was first translating this verse, I considered the thought that the rainbow, which was representing that Jehovah says that I will never again destroy the earth by flood. But it doesn't mean that he wouldn't do this in another way. He wouldn't bring correction in another, in another way. Now, when we think about the verses that talk about in that day, in that day is talking about the day of judgment. Thinking about that Jehovah says that he will never again destroy the earth by flood, that Jehovah will one day then bring wrath upon the earth. Now, when you take the concept of the rainbow and it's a it's a memory that we are to remember that he will not do that again by by flood. However, could the bow with a cachette, could it be a bow made of a rainbow? Just a thought. And it was just one of those fleeting thoughts that I had that it is a a symbol that no, I will not be doing this by flood, but I will be bringing correction in this other way. And he certainly will. Because keshet means, keshet means either bow or rainbow. Just a fleeting thought. I just thought I would bounce it off of you and see what you thought about that. That's certainly interesting. I had not considered that. But I think it is worth considering because we don't have other details surrounding it, such as like, He's covered in blood, or he has fire in his eyes, or he's got uh, arrows with him, or any, you know, an army's. There's other details that would be missing. So it does leave the door open, possibly. I don't lean that way, but it is very interesting to think about. I will say that, especially with the crown being so close using bow there. Well, you know, we naturally would translate according to the to to the context of the verse and of course to the context it is bow but it was just one of those fleeting thoughts that i had that i thought i would share yeah. i don't know just because it was interesting that's fun 
Uh, I did see a noticeable difference. We have in the King James, it says conquering and to conquer for this particular white horse and the person who sits upon it. And then our Hebrew Kuchin says prevail and be victorious. So there's some success in ours. And the other one is just conquering. Yes, and it can be to conquer and to be, well, the word technically, and remember, I translated according, very literal, as, as literal as I could, because when you get into the Hebrew idioms, but it is conquer to victor victory, or it is overcoming unto victory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there... Because it's ve netzach, which is victory. So there is yeah. victory involved here. Yeah. And it's interesting. Now that, that the, vav, yeah. that vav is a uh, conjunction, and that vav could be and, but, so, or, or. So it could be overcoming and victory and victorious because it's a noun to overcome and be successful, victorious, conquer. You know, you, you've got a few ways to translate this because we have to consider that this is this is a little clunky, but the vav is there for conjunction to give a connection to the two sentences. So a little bit of leeway there. All right. All right, let's move on to verse three. And it states, and when the second seal was opened, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Again, we have this, this same statement of come and see. So when do you see the cough prefix as you do on that very first word? You have the vav, cough. Remember, Hebrew is right to left, and English, of course, is read left to right. So the first word that is bekeven, is you have that cough there as a second letter and it's actually a prefix so when you see the cough prefix it means as soon as as right when it happened and then this happened now if if we were to see say a bet prefix bet prefix like we talked about last time is a progressive action uh, sometimes most of the times it's a progressive action and so now we have something that as soon as this happened, as soon as the second seal was opened, I heard the second living creature say, come and see the instant it happened. So there's kind of a, an urgency of you've got to see this. It just happened. Yeah. And uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out. If you flip over to the King James, it starts off with, and when he had opened the second seal, he being Yeshua, the lamb. Now, this this is just something where it differs. Maybe it got dropped off. Maybe uh, they left it out in translating. But ours doesn't say he or the lamb. We lost the lamb part, which is what you'll see in the next couple of verses. It'll be pretty consistent with that. And, and it says here, and when the second seal. So kind of lost the person opening the seal for this verse. And also notice that not all of the creatures are saying this this time. This one is just the second living creature saying, come and see. So that is exactly what the Greek is saying too. I heard the second beast say, come and see. So one of the things though, that is a check mark for this particular chapter. When you compare to the Hebrew Cochin, we do have four horses. And they are the same colors except for one. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But it's not a big difference. And then another thing is we have, the, we have the same amount of seals. And we have the same amount of sayings that are, that are lining up. So these are good anchor points of saying, hey, even if we have any corruption with any of these, we are still getting the message through. And we're still getting the meat and potatoes of what is being said have confidence in this process. Absolutely, Brian. And it will always be encouraging and inspiring because you know what? Even though the Greek uh, is not perfect, 
it has been used all these years and has also been encouraging to each and every one of us. Although I love the Hebrew, I love the fact that this is extremely encouraging to consider that with the Aramaisms that we may actually have something that is promising. And of course, the only way to confirm that is if we have a, another copy, another manuscript that we can say, we can compare to, to say this could be it. And then once we do the comparison, now we have something to hang our hat on. At this point, we say, this is hopeful. This is very encouraging. And that's where I'm at. It's very hopeful and encouraging, at least it is for me. Absolutely. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to show you what's in this manuscript. Everybody yeah. needs to know. So that we're getting the information out. And by the way, we're doing this for free. So make sure you share this out with people. We want as many hands as possible. We want as many scholars as possible. We want everybody to see what's in it because it really hasn't gotten out. People don't really know what's in this. And it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And they don't. And now that you mentioned it, it would be very important to mention that you can download this for free on academia.edu. And you can study along with this. Forgive me for not saying that sooner, but it it is absolutely for free out there. And it's out there for a reason so that we can grow as a people and learn what the Father is speaking to us through this coaching revelation. All right, verse four. And then another went out, a red horse sitting on it was authorized to take peace from the earth and he was given a great sword. So Brian, here's where it gets really interesting. When you see the, the words, and he was given a great sword. So when I first translated this, I first translated that he was allowed to do great destruction. And he is. And then there's this other part where he is allowed to he was given a great sword either way the outcome is still the same he is going to do great destruction whether it's with the sword of some sort or if it's just that he is allowed to do it with you know just a the destruction in general but i do want to point out when you see in the interlinear tables this this lichak the lichak is aramaism and it's just one of those things to, to alert you that this is something that was an influence of John speaking both Hebrew and Aramaic. And with the influence of the two languages, the Lechach turned to Lechach, and it influenced his language so that he gets his own, let's say, slang, uh, his own dialect, so to speak. It's not just him. This was the, this was the tradition of the first century during that time it's written in this revelation is written in rabbinic hebrew with many words out of the mishnah and it is also with the influence the aramaism all of these are hebrew grammar markers that we're looking for from the first century so that's why i wanted to draw your attention to that because this is another marker to say we've got something pretty important here now he's coming to do great destruction or he's coming with a great sword either way he's coming to destroy yeah and you know my mind went with well he's removing peace so then i started thinking up of well what does that look like how could that possibly play out in the world today and removing peace as in taking away things that keep peace. So some examples of that would be making it illegal to defend oneself, maybe defunding the police, or taking away guns, possibly taking away your freedom of speech and being able to expose those taking away your freedoms and your ability to defend yourself. So I don't know, those, those things kind of popped into my mind while I was you know, seeing this verse. I thought I'd throw that in for people who want to try to understand what does peace being taken away from the earth look like? Well, it removes the system there that keeps you safe. And so then you have anarchy and you have violence. And that's how Absolutely. you do that. Surely, 
things are looking interesting. And like I said, every time we release a video, it seems as something seems to escalate with each chapter. Call it my imagination. I don't think so. I watch the news fairly closely. <laughs> so I think that something happens every time. And it could be very well that the timing that that the father is saying, get this message out to my people. And I think we're in um, we're in a very dangerous time today, yeah, and, honestly. And we, and we will answer that call to get this out here. We, you can count on us. That's right. Um, before we move on, I just want to point out real quick, if we flip over to the King James, we have one little section of this verse that seems to be added. And it's very wordy. It doesn't really fit. the the Both of these sentences all match each other, but this one part, it says, that they should kill one another. So they put that extra information in there about the world losing its peace, but that they should kill one another. So this kind of appears to be an add-in. I don't know how it got there, but it's interesting. It's not in our Hebrew coaching. But you're right. There are big differences between the coaching Hebrew revelation versus the Greek and the Aramaic. Yeah, and thinking about it, it makes sense if you're thinking about how a lot of these inserts sometimes look like explanations or in, or inferences where people are uh, thinking or adding extra information. So in this case, if the world lost its peace, what would happen? Well, people would kill each other. So I can see Absolutely. how it just could be added in over the times. Maybe a scribal comment. And people were killing each or people would kill each other. And then it becomes part of the, the Greek. All right, let's go on to verse five. And it says, then when the third seal was open, the third living creature said, come and see. And I saw a black horse and one sitting on it was with a set of scales in his hand. We are assuming, of course, by the subject previously, that the one opening the seals is, of course, the lamb. But you see, grammatically, there's some big differences between the Cochin Hebrew Revelation, the, the Greek, and the Aramaic. Now, this lamb opening this seal is bringing forth hyperinflation. And of course, in America, we've not really seen hyperinflation as what this is describing. Hyperinflation is you go to buy a loaf of bread in the morning, and by noon, you can't afford that loaf of bread because it has skyrocketed because of the prices that are increasing every moment. And I know this has happened in a number of countries, and this is extremely um, frightening. It is extremely frightening when you see that, but this is why we are learning this because there's hope for those who are seeking the heart of the Father and those that know where they belong and they will follow through with what he's called them to do. And that is to guard his word, his way, and his will. Right. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll say, you know, higher inflation, doing things like this market-wise, this is all just tools of oppression, tools to control the masses and to make them suffer and to display power over the people. And this quickly makes me think of elites in the government or big corporations tying in with those elites who are in power and possibly even the banks. Maybe the banks are in on this, but definitely the economy is the focus of this verse. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, and I'll say for looking at the King James, again, we, we had, and when he had opened the third seal, and notice we don't have he, we don't have the lamb either, but uh, we certainly know that it is Yeshua. So this is a just a text variant here. Verse 6, and it says, Then I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a measure of wheat for two faces, three measures of barley for two faces, but the oil and the wine do not injure. All right, so this is pretty interesting because when you compare this to the King James, we have some slight differences, particularly the focus of how it's describing currency. 
in the King James, we have a, a penny for wheat and three measures of barley for a penny. Penny doesn't really get the message across. The Greek there that they're translating as penny is denarian, and it's of the Latin origin of denarius, which is, which is a Roman silver coin, which weighs 0.1375 of an ounce. Now, denarius was, at that time, an ordinary pay for a day's wages. So the way you would read this is, it's a day's wage for wheat, and it's three times as much for barley. And that doesn't make any sense. Historically, barley was the poor man's wheat. So everything is flipped and inflated extremely high. But the wealthy people who own the oil and the wine, those are the elites. Those are the richest of richest people who were oil producers or winemakers. They were very well off. And everybody wanted some of that. They are untouched. So there is a lot of message in here. And of course, we can reference the parable of the vineyard and the laborers in regards to pay and, and being paid correctly. And that's in Matthew chapter 20, verse 2. But it's not penny. And to see it say two faces actually makes a lot of sense. Because if we're thinking about Yeshua and him talking about, well, whose face is on the coin? When they're saying render under Caesar, who's Caesar's, who do we who who do we pay our taxes to? And Yeshua chooses a third option that they didn't even consider. Whose face is on it? Well, that means they own it. So this is owned currency by someone else, essentially, but um, but that is a Hebraic way of talking. That's a Hebraic mindset to say faces there. Absolutely. And I went looking also through the Mishnah and other manuscripts and so forth to see where we could find maybe the Hebrew idiom of faces also meaning faces of coins, but I couldn't find anything such as that. However, it, this does appear to be an idiom meaning faces of coins and of course which coins i don't know um that's a good question that maybe well, it's in the future it's in the future so we don't know yet <laughs> we don't know yet well to tie this into again more futuristic stuff we can reference in james chapter 5 verse 1 through 11 is speaking about end times and how the oil and wine and the super rich are going to control the food supply so this lines up with more future prophecy that inflation's common people and you need to have storable food and you need to grow your own crops and prepare because it's not going to be peaceful and there's not going to be affordable food, essentially. Point of the verse is it's inflation. Everything's going to cost more. Absolutely. <laughs> but the rich are not touched. Yeah. That's absolutely it's right. Gonna, and the poor people are the ones who are just living off bread and barley. So uh, they're the ones who are going to suffer. And I, I see that in this verse as well. But consider this. Remember when the hidden manna we talked about, and I said that I believe that to be Yeshua. Remember in John 6, where Yeshua fed the 5,000, and then there were 12 baskets remaining of the barley loaves. That barley loaves that's remaining, he says, you, he told the 5,000, he says, you ate and you were satisfied. You partook and you were satisfied. And then he divided the, the barley loaves and there were 12 baskets of barley loaves remaining. So the barley loaves actually is a blessed thing because of the fact that we are partaking of what Yeshua provides. And that is the barley. I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a blessing, honestly. Well, to start the new year for the the creator's calendar, the Hebrew calendar of the time of Yeshua, they had to present and wave barley to God on first fruits. So uh, barley is very important, very important for the whole system. 
and we'll have Come it on. in the future as well for the millennial reign. All right. Let's go on to verse 7. And it states, And when the fourth seal opened, I heard the fourth living creature say, Come and see. Again, we have come and see. And that's exactly what's also in the Greek and the Aramaic. So we are being very consistent. Amen. Also, notice it has he in the Aramaic and in the scriptures and the King James. Again, they're pointing to Yeshua is the one who's pulling the seal off. We know that. He's already stated that. But it's interesting. We don't have the he and the lamb also is not in there. So this is the reason why it is extremely important that you are pointing out pronouns because this will be a hot topic in the future because of the fact that pronouns shouldn't change. If this were a translation from the Greek manuscript and into Hebrew, you certainly wouldn't be messing up the pronouns. Pronouns will give it away. And if you don't see a pronoun, in this and you do in the greek then clearly this is not a translation from the greek so just bear that in mind because this is going to come up again in the future chapters and also kudos to our translation and the team that went into this working on this that we didn't add anything in there we didn't add the lamb we didn't add he in there even though we know yeshua is stripping these seals we didn't put anything in there that didn't belong. That's why we have this inner linear in here. So everybody can see our work, check behind us, and they can tell exactly what we did. That's right. We show our work and then people can learn Hebrew through this revelation. Absolutely. Amen. So be it. All right. Let's move on to verse eight. And it states, then I saw a strong muddled horse and the one who sat upon him was named the messenger of death and Gehenna went after him. He was given authority to cause death to a fourth upon the earth with sword, hunger, and death by the living creatures of the earth. When you're looking at this strong modeled horse, the modeling it is actually pretty interesting when you're looking at, say, the Freiburg uh, Hebrew manuscript. The Freiburg is clearly a translation from the Greek. Freiburg uh, HS314 Reve uh, Revelation is pretty much word for word matching the Greek with a few changes where they Hebra Hebraized, say that again. How do you say it? Hebra Hebraized. How do you say that? <laughs> Hebraic, Hebraicized. Hebra, Hebraicized? Hebraicized, I guess. <laughs> That's my guess. Okay, let me let me actually rephrase that. So what the Freiburg, excuse me, what the Freiburg scribe did was that he changed a few words to match more with the Hebrew, and he did not keep to the true translation with some words because he wanted it to appear more like the Hebrew. But it is absolutely word for word. Then you get into the Paris 131, which also is a translation from the Greek. And of course, Hazon is another manuscript that is a translation from the Greek. The Gaster 1616, the Manchester Gaster 1616 is a corrupted manuscript because the scribe added in to the text some marginal notes and made it part of the his copy which is now considered corrupted and it's not even good to use so saying all that all of them have green horse or light green horse or whatever they say now the paris 131 manuscript they like to dash it up a little bit and he said it wasn't just a green horse it was a lime green horse but they all still stuck to the essential green horse. We're looking at something that is entirely different. We're looking at a mottled horse and it actually means dented like hail horse. So here's a horse that comes out and it has like hail dents all over him. He has been in a hailstorm. 
So, and then the messenger who was riding the horse is the messenger of death. And of course, Gehinom went after him. And so now there's going to be a fourth of the earth that is killed or destroyed with the sword, the hunger by death of the living creature, by the living creatures of the earth. Now, what this modeled horse is meaning his look of appearance, he's coming out of what seems to be this great hail storm, and he's bringing with him something that is just absolutely horrible. And then these creatures are going to be destroying people as well, and there's going to be this, this coming upon the earth, the hunger, the death. So just some interesting insight that I would draw your attention to, Brian. Yeah, and then I'll put images up about the what modeled looks like and you know you could see the aramaic is kind of matching a little bit you know pale and then you have the king james does pale but you have the scriptures doing green horse and i've seen that there are manuscripts out there that have green horse like you think if someone is pale or they're sick you might refer to them as pale oh you're looking pale or oh you're looking green so they think it's sickly and that's an easy jump considering you're seeing death in the grave and people dying in this verse. So it's just, it's interesting that some will do pale, some will do green, and then some will do pale green. Uh, but ours is very unique because we don't just have the horse color. We have a strong horse. It says, I saw a strong muddled horse. So that's also interesting that this horse is strong. And, you know, if you think of a sickly horse, why are you mentioning strong on there? So that's kind of unique and kind of takes away that this is a sickly horse. You know, the color is very unique here. To go further, uh, one of the things I like to see is Gehenna. That is a Hebrew thought pattern. That is how you describe the end. You want to say death, and you want to say the final destruction. Gehenna is a, an analogy, a metaphor for how God is going to burn up those in the end that, that don't make it into the book of life. Uh, Gehenna captures this essence of lake of fire. It's burning, and it consumes and destroys everything. Gehenna was the Valley of Hinnom, and that's where the garbage dump of Jerusalem was. It's also where the pagans in that time would do sacrifice of babies, unfortunately, to Molech and some other gods, but that was a place of burning and destruction, and so there is great symbolism there, and we know that Yeshua was referring to Gehenna in the way he talks about the end times. Absolutely. Let's jump over quickly before we move on. Let's look at the King James. There is something unique about that King James there. It has in the first line a double look, which is very strange, very odd, almost not necessary for the sentence structure. It says, and I looked and behold a pale horse. So these are double looking you don't need that. If he says he look and there was, you don't need to say behold. So that's also interesting. Um, I think what they did was this in the in the Greek scriptures, the scriptures and Aramaic, it says, and I looked and lo in Aramaic and the scriptures and I looked and I saw, they just chose the translation a little different. Mm -hmm. But it basically says, and I looked and I saw in the Greek. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Hebrew Cochin says, I saw. Yeah, it's not <laughs> redundant. And that's also mm -mm. interesting because that might be something that would happen when you change languages. So that's a point for our Hebrew Cochin revelation. All right, let's move on to verse 9. And it states, And when he opened the fifth, I saw beneath the holy place the souls that were killed for the holy name and for the sake of their testimony. Now, we have some pretty vast differences between the Cochin Hebrew and the Greek translation, the Greek to English translation and the Aramaic to English translation. We have 
the fifth that doesn't go into seal, but which we know it is the seal. And when he opened the fifth, and then of course the Greek to English, it says, and he opened the fifth seal. And of course, same with Aramaic. Of course, the Aramaic and the Greek is going to match pretty closely together because it surely looks like that the Aramaic is a translation from the Greek. And of course, we saw underneath the holy place where they're, they've translated a little differently between the slaughter place and the altar. What does the King James say, Brian? Yeah. So the King James does not say holy place. It says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. That word of God could be the Torah. That would certainly make sense. But I've never seen anybody make that argument. In regards to using the Greek and English here, that these people were killed because they defended the Torah. There's an interesting little nugget and thought there for people who use King James Version. But yeah, we don't have altar. We have the holy place. Where is the holy place? That's the temple. Absolutely. And also consider that we have the the Hebrew word Hashem. Hashem is a rabbinical term that is used in place or instead of the name of Yehovah. Now we've got the word um, for Kadosh that we have now coupled with Hashem. And it actually could be meaning that it's for the holy Yehovah and for the sake of their testimony. So bear that in mind that it very well could be that there this phrase should be translated as the holy Jehovah. Yeah, that's good. Also to remember that because sometimes there is a lot of nuance behind these words and it could be translated two ways. In this case, it could be holy name or it could be referring to holy Jehovah. So um, we have to state both of those as a possibility. Now it's interesting that the uh, Greek didn't go that direction either they stated for the word of god there for that spot all right verse 10 then they shout with a great voice saying the lord is holy and faithful until when will you judge and avenge our blood for those dwelling upon the earth now it it's important to note that in the internet, you want to see when something's singular or plural. Of course, when we're looking at the blood, it is the blood plural, bloods. It's not one blood, it's the bloods of those that were dwelling upon the earth. And so we're wanting you to avenge all of the bloods that are upon the earth. And so Keep that in mind when you're looking through the interlinear tables to analyze and assess, is this singular, is this plural, and how is this used? Because it doesn't seem to, when it's translated to English, it loses a lot of the impact. It's, and that's why it's important to pay attention to what you have in the interlinear tables. Yep, absolutely. I completely agree. Now, before we move on, I just want to say this verse is quite similar in the Aramaic and the Greek and the English. But I'll say this, though, that the King James and the, the English, it rearranges the sentence structure. So that's kind of unique. They, they switch things around and instead of faithful, they have true. So that's just a little tidbit in there for this verse. All right, let's move on to verse 11. It says, And every one of them was given white garments, and it was said to them, Relax still a little while. Wow, Brian. Do you see the differences between the Greek to English translation and oh, the Aramaic yes. to English? This is a big <laughs> difference here. And is this is something we really got to pay attention to. And notice that the Greek and the Aramaic match pretty closely yep. are going neck and neck with each other. Yeah, there's so much added at the end of this verse for verse 11. When you compare it to the King James, 
you can see that after the word little season, instead of while, you know, ours says a little while, they say a little season. Well, we know what a season is. So they're, they're kind of grasping the concept time frame after a little time frame. Then the King James, it says until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. All that is not in this verse. It is at the end of this verse. So how did the Aramaic and the Greek get this extra almost sentence tagged on to the end of this? And a lot of times what happens, there are marginal notes that someone was writing, say, note to self, or maybe they received their own vision and added the marginal notes. And someone, a copyist who comes behind them, takes that marginal note and includes it in their, co in their copy of their manuscript. And then they make it basically a scripture for you. And so there's no way for you to know if that original manuscript that they had copied from is later destroyed and that's what we're left with these are copies of copies of copies of copies and so where did it come from i don't know so it's a good question yeah and it's it's not very clear too it almost seems like it's just extra ramblings at the end it's i mean it, you could piece out an understanding from it but it's not super clear which is what you would want to see from a hebrew source hebrew is direct and clear when you get into the greek it gets less clear gets a little muddy and then you know changing languages multiple times and maybe some extra notes in it's going to get messy and you're going to lose your directness and your clarity so that's kind of what we're seeing all right let's move on to verse 12 then i saw that he opened the sixth then there were tremblings of the earth and the sun became dark, and the moon was red as blood. This certainly looks very intriguing and definitely intense. We've got the rattlings, actually, of the earth. It's the rattlings, the tremors, the tremblings of the earth that are happening. And the sun, it, it was already. And it, we've got this tense problem going on again. And it's just interesting. One minute he's talking future tense, and the next he's talking of past tense. And of course, he's got these active participles that's going on. He's he's really all over the place with his verb tenses. And it's it gets to be quite clunky, but he's still trying to tell his story. And to say there was this thing that happened, but he's talking about something that he saw in his vision that was in the future, clearly was in the future. And of course, the moon was red like blood. Interesting. And you, yeah. And then you compare that to the King James. They have an added piece of information about this sun becoming black. And theirs, it says black as sackcloth of hair. So this is not in ours, and this is extra information for clarity. Well, we know the sun turns black, the moon turns red. Those are the focus that they're turning something into a color. But this is describing the type of sackcloth color that's black. I don't know what region the sackcloth is black. Maybe it's a desert goat that is a black goat hair. That's kind of what I'm imagining here. But it's interesting that the sackcloth is not in ours, but it's also in the Aramaic. So there's a noticeable. It is fascinating. Difference. And then uh, notice another difference. You compare it to the King James. It says that there was a great earthquake, whereas ours doesn't say one great earthquake. It just says we're tremblings of the earth. So that would imply plural multiple earthquakes that's pretty and that is on target because it actually uh re adult is is plural and it literally translates as rattlings interesting rattlings tremors tremblings and there are multiple there's no doubt about it yeah well that expands the reach of the earthquakes or the effect of 
the planet being shaken. If it's just one great earthquake, well, yeah, they could have a tsunami, essentially, if it's near water. But the whole earth is not going to feel it. But if you have tremblings of the earth, well, quite possibly, that's the whole earth getting earthquakes all over. If it's a celestial event with the moon being affected, absolutely, all the plates are going to be shaking and moving. So this kind of fits with what we know, and it's pretty interesting to see that line up with scripture. All right, let's move on to verse 13, which it states, all their armies drop as a withering leaf from the vine, so like the withering fig tree. You know what I find interesting, Brian, is that people don't realize that when you see hosts in your Bible, it actually means armies. Zevaot, Zevaim, now he writes it here in a masculine plural versus a feminine plural, but it does mean armies. And so I translated it as literal as possible armies so that it's actually understood by everyone. Not everyone knows that Zevaot or Zevaim means armies. I just thought I would throw that out. Wow. So that is a very big change, a very big shift. Instead of these being stars, it is armies, you're telling me, that are fallen? Absolutely. Their armies are falling, not the stars of the heaven, not in the Cochin. It is saying their armies are dropping and falling like a withering leaf from a vine. And then, of course, you have the stars. Wow. That's in incredible. And, you know, that makes sense if there's no peace on earth and the sun turns black and there's giant earthquakes all over the planet all happening at once. Well, yeah, I think your armies might be affected. And then there might be some fighting over resources. So armies would be killing each other. And it might happen very fast and in a cataclysmic event such as this. I also thought it was interesting, though. You know, we have the leaf withering on the vine or shriveling fruit on a fig tree reference to Isaiah 34 verse 4. So that's interesting and cool to see our manuscript linking up to the Tanakh. And that's the beauty of having a Hebrew manuscript, because now you don't have to try to connect the dots through the Greek. You actually can connect the Hebrew to Hebrew in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And I, and I love that part because you're going to see a lot of connections like that. Yeah, and before we move on to verse 14, I also want to show you real quick that the King James has some added words as well. Following this verse, it says the part that's added, when she was shaken off a mighty wind. So that part is essentially added. It's not part of that verse for when you compare it to what we have here. In verse 13 from the coaching. Very interesting. All right. Let's read verse 14 in which it states, Then all the mountains and hills he moved to and fro, and they were shaken from their places. So we do have a word that appear that is truly misspelled, and it could be that it was a transcribing error. It could be that simply some letters were left off. We don't know. But it appears to me to be two separate words. And the node being the first part of the word, the noon dalit. And that, of course, he moved to and fro. And the second half of the word is also misspelled. Zu azu, they were shaken. So this it was actually pretty difficult to translate because of the terrible spelling problem we have here. But it truly does mean shaken. They were shaken or shaken, uh, moved to and fro shaken. So it looks like it's both according to the spelling of this word, or I should say misspelling of the word. And so now we have all the mountains and hills that are moved to and fro, and they were shaken from their places. Yeah, and it's 
interesting that this one is short and sweet and the english is a little more wordy actually and in fact it doesn't use the same words that we're using here for what is crashing down or being moved the english will say mountain and island and you can see that also in the aramaic mountains and islands however ours says mountains and hills and that makes sense if it's being shaken everything's going to settle down you're going to lose some mountains um, so it's interesting that they went with island what if it's an island with no mountains hmm, that's an interesting thought very uh, interesting yeah and then also in the english it has a little bit of an extra beginning a little added beginning that in the king james it says and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And then you have every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So we don't have that beginning part describing the scroll part, but you can see it in the Aramaic as well. We have short and sweet, the mountains and the hills were moved and shaken. And they fell from them places, essentially. It is fascinating to see all these additions in the Greek to English and the Aramaic to English. It's just um, clearly they were not afraid of adding to or taking away from the words this prophecy. Really, really sad. And notice that any addition is always the Greek and Aramaic agreeing. And it's not that we have additions where it's just us in the Greek or the Cochin is alone. In fact, the Cochin is tighter and less wordy. And that's indicative of something being older. Because over time, you start getting longer sentences. And every time you change languages, you're going to add words for clarification. Because you don't know how to describe certain things. So you add extra helping words. So this is good to see. Tight, clear, precise, and direct. Absolutely. All right, verse 15. I really like this one. And I'll tell you why I like this one. Because bunkers. I I come from a line of West Virginia people. We like digging in the dirt. I like digging in the dirt. And I feel like this verse is just screaming out to people to get bunkers. That's just the way I feel about it. Uh, we'll, you'll see what I'm saying when I read this. All right, verse 15. And it says, and the kings of the earth, the rulers, the wealthy, the officers, the servants, and the free men hid themselves in rocks, in caves, and in the burrows of the earth. Now, I take the burrows of the earth to be bunkers, underground bunkers. I want a bunker. I would love to build a root cellar and also connect it to a bunker. I just, I'm all about bunkers. All right. I said it enough. All right. There you go. You know, that's a good point, Brian, because we have a lot of our neighbors who have also built bunkers. There's a gentleman that they that he builds the bunkers and they come in and they dig. Now, that's a pretty big deal here in the hill country of Texas because we have a pretty hard ground limestone and they will go and blast and make this underground whole living place for these people for that doomsday that everybody's waiting for and everybody senses it right now everybody senses it and they are either a prepping for their food prepping in some other way whether it's uh firearms or who knows and people are going to realize that the only way they're going to make it is not by bunkers and not by food storage but it's going to be by trusting in Jehovah and trusting that the hidden manna of Yeshua is provided and we will not go hungry because Yeshua clearly said in John 6 35 he says I am the bread of life he who comes to me shall not get hungry at all he who believes in me shall not get thirsty at all so what is that coming to him I don't know it's probably prayer praise worship and walking in the commands of Yehovah and the believing in him is more than believing. It's imunah. Imunah is walking out the faith and in the commands that we are to walk out. Imunah is 
I believe so much that I'm going to follow through and I'm going to guard and keep the commands that he has commanded me to keep. And then that hidden manna is provided to the people of Jehovah. And we don't have to worry about these things. We will be hidden in broad daylight and protected. We don't need a bunker. Yep, absolutely. And that's why the elite, the wealthy, the rulers, and the kings of the earth are going to be in these bunkers. And then the next verse will point out that they they even want to die because they know it's it's bad. You know, the whole earth is is really bad, but then the lamb is coming back. And so let that actually leads us perfectly for this next verse here. Let's go ahead and read in verse 16. Saying to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from before the sight of him sitting upon the throne, who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So these people are going underground. They're hiding, trying to escape. Yeshua's coming. So take notice that they at this point know that this is an act of Elohim, an act of God. They know for a fact that this is not one man against another man. This is God himself who is now bringing judgment upon the earth and they are fearing him. This is at the point where the fear of Jehovah is going upon the people. They now are saying, I am terrified. I have done poorly in my walk or if there's even been a walk at all with him and they now are terrified of not any man but they are terrified of Jehovah and from the wrath of the lamb yep you don't want to be in his wrath path <laughs> that's what i would say exactly all right and actually this verse actually matches pretty good with the greek and the aramaic they're pretty much the same and so that's also cool to point out all right, let's finish up with the very last verse. It says, verse 17, For the day of his wrath of anger has come, and who will be able to stand before him? And notice at the end of this sentence, it says before him, and that's what we have. And notice that the scriptures in the English, the Aramaic doesn't have before him, like in front of God, you're standing before God himself. So that's kind of uh, interesting to have that added in and not added into the Aramaic. It's unique. Clearly, no one will be able to stand before him unless he allows them to stand before him. For it is better to be on the side of Jehovah versus the side of Satan himself. There is no in-between. There is no middle of the ground. And when people say, well, I'm going to be like this person and this person and this person, they're being lukewarm and they're like chameleons who change according to the group of people they're in. Well, let me explain to you that lukewarmness is actually owned by Satan. You're not on Jehovah's side. When Moses came and he says, those who are with Jehovah, come stand next to me. Those who are not, you know, you stay there. And of course, who dies? Those that are against Jehovah. And it's today that we are to choose whose side that we are standing with. And we are all are given a choice. Either we are going to submit and say, I'm yours. You're going to serve one or the other. There's not an option of your own life. Everything of this earth is owned by Jehovah. Every soul on this earth is owned by Jehovah. Psalms 24 is very clear. He owns everything. And read Psalms 24 very carefully. Those who say they have sold their soul, well, they didn't own it in the first place, so they can't sell their soul. It was always and is always owned by Jehovah, and he's given that ownership to Yeshua. So therefore, turn to Jehovah, follow his commands, and obey him. This is where you put yourself on his side and not the side of Satan. We have a choice. All right? Isn't that what you just said? We do. We have a choice. Whose side are we going to stand on? That's our decision today. Right. And to go further with that, we have a choice with this Hebrew manuscript. We are giving you out the pearls and you have this opportunity now. What are you going to do with these pearls? Mm -hmm. We're not to throw our pearls before swine because what? 
the pearls are not appreciated. They're eaten up and destroyed by the swine. So we've spent a lot of time working on this manuscript, years on this manuscript. And so we are bringing it out to you to see these pearls, to see these wonderful hidden things in this manuscript. And now it's up to you, the listener, to share this out, to get this into more people's hands. We want this to fly around the world. We're, we're getting messages from people around the world about how this walkthrough is blessing them and bringing new understanding and depth of thinking about these verses in new ways. And the potential that this has on the scholarly world to change the way people approach text criticism for New Testament manuscripts, not knowing that there are Hebrew ones out there, there's actually a lot of them. And they're now being analyzed in a serious manner. And so it's really exciting what is happening today. And we're on the tip of the spear. And people who are part of this study is along with us. You are part of the tip of the spear. You are part of making history and, and really changing this, this culture of academic world into saying, hey, listen, we're not going to ignore this anymore. You know, there pretty much is a conspiracy where the Old Testament is just the Hebrew and the Jewish people. They stay in that camp. They don't look at anything else. And then the scholarly Christian world, the seminaries and the college campuses out there that focus on these manuscripts, they only are interested in the Greek. And so there is this giant void and nobody's really looking at it. So being a part of this walkthrough study, you are actually making history. So, and you're driving this new idea and this new concept that there's something here and more people need to look at it. So that's pretty exciting. So really grateful for our listeners. We just want to say thank you for being along with us. We love you. And we love our comments and all the emails we get and, and all the people saying, keep going, keep going. This is amazing. You know, that fills us with love and joy and is wind to our sails. So thank you so much. So, But before we sign off, I want to let Janice get one more uh, thing off of her chest, I guess. Yeah. And I, what I want to do is add one more thing. It is extremely important that this series educate your viewers on the Hebrew, the grammar, because as I always say, the mysteries are hidden in the grammar. And there are true mysteries hidden in all of the New Testament, Kochi New Testament grammar. And it's, ex it's extremely exciting to see this. You haven't seen anything yet until you get to chapter 7 of Revelation and chapter 14 of Revelation. Because now we're going to see who the 144,000 really are. It's not who you think it is, according to the grammar. So next time you're going to see something pretty mind blowing. So you don't want to miss these, these chapters. So pretty exciting stuff coming, Brian. And it has been a pleasure. All right. There's your teaser. Get ready for chapter seven. All right. And here at Project Truth Ministries, we're encouraging to seek the truth, whatever it may be and wherever it may take you. Keep reading your Bible. And as always, God bless.